Welcome to the seminar and welcome our speaker, um, Dr. Chris Anderson, who has the uh, current title of Intelligence Community Postdoctoral Research Fellow who at Stanford, but now also at Illinois, and the title, this odd title of Adjunct Assistant Professor, which means basically that he will become an assistant professor in the material science department in January um, 2024. So we're very pleased that, uh, you know, that uh, Chris has decided to join our fine institution, University of Illinois, and specifically, you'll be my colleague in the, in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Uh, Chris comes to us, you know, his educational training comes through us by path, by the path that includes University of Michigan as an undergraduate physics and chemistry major, uh, a PhD at the University of Chicago. I guess PhD is in molecular engineering. That's physics, in physics. Okay. Physics, yeah. All right. Uh, and the and uh, and postdoctoral work now uh, at Stanford University. He's an expert, as you're going to hear in his talk, on building a quantum internet with photons and spin. He's an expert in the interactions of you know light with quantum mechanical defect states. Uh, you know in solids. A few other notable um, uh, achievements, accomplishments of Chris or is that he's the founder of the Open Quantum Initiative, a mission, whose mission is to increase diversity, equity, inclusion in the quantum sciences. So I think uh, uh, been starting to have a lot of influence. And Chris was the recipient of the 2022 Quantum Creators Prize. So welcome, Chris. Looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you, David. So hopefully everyone can hear me. I have two mics, which is sort of a new thing for me. Uh, so I'm super happy to be here and to be giving this seminar for multiple reasons, as David was saying. One, to share the work that we've been doing at Stanford as a postdoc, and also work that I've been doing sort of uh, just down the road here at UChicago as a grad student. But I think also just to sort of give a shout out for the work that I want to do here. And part of this is a recruiting pitch to you or your friends. I'm looking for undergrads, grad students, postdocs. So please contact me, grab me during lunch. So I'm really, really excited to be here. As David mentioned, I'll be in the material science department, but I'll have affiliations in physics and engineering as well. So we sort of connect broadly to the expertise here, which I think is really exciting. But the work that I'll be telling you about today focuses, as David mentioned, on this idea of building something called a quantum internet by harnessing the power of single photons, single particles of light, and electron spins, or the quantum states of electrons. And so given that this is the IQIS seminar, I won't go too much into detail here, but the thing that we really, really like about quantum states is they offer, for one, this larger dimensional space states, the, the, the block sphere. And so think about this quintessential quantum two-level system, which is just electron spin. If we put that in a magnetic field, its energy, energy levels split into two through the Zeeman effect, basically giving us two states that are the electron spin aligned or anti-aligned, with an applied magnetic field. And if we have this two-level system, we can create interesting quantum superposition states that describe where we are, this larger dimensional state space on the block sphere with this distinct quantum phase. And if I create one of these superposition states, the coherence time simply just means how long does the state survive before this quantum phase gets scrambled by some interaction with the environment? Once again, this is something that many of you are familiar with, but I'll just go through briefly. And there's this other feature of quantum that we really, really like, which is entanglement. It's this intrinsic linking between states of two particles where measurements and operations on one qubit can instantaneously affect another. And this is sort of you know, famously what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And as all of you know, since you're here, the amazing thing about quantum science is we can harness all of these properties to create new ways of communicating, new ways of sensing our natural world, and new ways of computing. So quantum computing is something all of you are probably aware of, but I'm not talking about quantum computers today. I wanna to talk about this idea of a quantum internet. So, so what is that? Um, well, I get really excited by the regular internet that we use today. It's really, really amazing. We can have Zoom calls across the country, your cell phone talks to a satellite in space. So this networking of information processing devices gives us the world today that we know and love. And so similarly, in the quantum world, I get really excited about building quantum internet, optic sort of optical network backbone to distribute entanglement 
you need quantum modems to hook up your quantum computers to that network. And then you can maybe have sensors hooked up to this network as well. So there's this fun idea of you know, building this analog of the classical information technologies that we have today in the quantum world. And if we can do this, there's some really exciting applications that we can achieve. From making distributed sensors, let's say of things like quantum gravity, to making more powerful modular quantum computers, to doing things like QKD or sort of secure communications that are fundamentally secured by the laws of physics. And so the core story that I'll be telling you about is this idea of how do we take these quintessential quantum two-level systems, these electron spins that can point up and down, and how do we couple them using photons, using light? And so what I hope to convince you is that if your goal is to distribute entanglement over long distances, you really have to use photons because photons are these amazing carriers of quantum information, right? They travel at the speed of light. You can put them into optical tubes, optical fibers, and there's no background population of photons at room temperature, right? If you turn out the lights in this room, there might be infrared light, but the room is actually dark. There's no visible photons at room temperature. And of course, if you're distributing quantum states over long distances and looking at entanglement, you can also probe nice fundamental physics. As many of you know, last year's Nobel Prize in, Nobel Prize in Physics was sort of related to these ideas of distributing entangled states of photons. So the type of electron spin qubit that I'll be focusing on are these defects in diamond or these defects in solids. So a quintessential example is this so-called nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, which is simply just a nitrogen substitutional atom next to a vacancy in this diamond lattice. In this defect, it traps some electrons. And those electrons have both spin and optical structure that we can use to form a qubit. And in particular, the system looks a lot like we like to say a trapped atom in a solid, where we have a long lived spin ground state that can store quantum information, but we also have these orbitals so we can absorb and emit light, much like an atom. But we're sort of trapped in the solid, there's no trapping lasers. We just have this defect and our state is trapped in a crystal. And these envy centers in diamond have been used for a wide range of really amazing proof of concept uh, experiments in quantum from doing sensing of molecules to doing quantum error correction, teleporting quantum states over long distances. But if there's one thing I hope you get from this talk is that this envy center in diamond, which some of you may have heard of, uh, is not the only game in town. And actually over the past 10 years or so, there's really been an explosion in this field, finding not only new types of defects in diamond, but also defects in qubits in different materials. And so today I'll be focusing on this material, silicon carbide, which is really, really amazing. And like I said, over the past five, 10 years, we've discovered a wide range of different qubits that we can play with in this material. And the one I'll be focusing on in particular is this dye vacancy, which is simply just a missing carbon atom next to a missing silicon atom in this silicon carbide lattice. So there's this natural next question, which is, you know, why would you choose one material over another to host these quantum states? Uh, the first, at least comparing diamond and silicon carbide, is silicon carbide is a wafer scale semiconductor. So here is a tiny two by two millimeter chip of diamond and a four inch wafer of silicon carbide. And these two samples cost around the same price. All while silicon carbide displays many of the amazing properties of diamond. It's actually used in fake diamond jewelry. So it's hard, it's chemically inert, it's optically transparent, it has high index of refraction but it's also a real semiconductor that you can dope. So it's found use in power electronics, which is really its main sort of application today, where it's used in components in Tesla cars, 5G, 5G technologies, you know, MOSFETs and LED light bulbs. This is a real commercial technology that's, uh, that's used today. And there's this, uh, there's this fun sort of trend, actually there's even efforts here at Illinois, about looking beyond silicon for new semiconductors to make classical and maybe even quantum electronics better. And so there was this fun article in the New York Times. Um, and the reason I think it's fun is because it features a photo of my hands holding a tiny chip of silicon carbide that'll actually produce some of the data you see in this talk. I, that wasn't on my bingo list. <laughs> um, and you know, this, this obviously connects to this Chips and Science Act in the US. So we're, we're connecting sort of EVs, semiconductors, and quantum all together. And there's a lot of excitement around this material. So uh, there's this fun quote from the New York uh, governor, 
which as someone who recently came from Silicon Valley, I, I sort of hate, but as someone who loves Silicon Carbide, I, I think is really cool. And it basically just says like, hey, have you heard of Silicon Valley? Yeah, it's totally overrated. We're gonna build a new Silicon Carbide Valley. So there's these billion dollar fabrication facilities for Silicon Carbide popping up around the US, which is very exciting. But of course, I'm not gonna talk to you about you know, power electronics. I'm here to talk about quantum. So the other things that we love about Silicon Carbide is the quality of the qubits that we can make inside of them. So I'll tell you about that. And two is our ability to make integrated photonics with this material. So circuits that guide the flow of light on a chip. And so I told you that our dream was to connect two electrons using light. So having circuits that guide the flow of light on a chip becomes really, really important. So silicon carbide is in this nice middle ground between the quantum sort of traditional course of diamond and this classical course of silicon, where we have both this so-called CMOS compatibility, wafer scale electronics and photonics, and this sort of optically addressable spin qubit uh, that can even have coherence up to room temperature. So as a brief outline of the sort of the rest of the talk, I'll give you some sort of more specific details on how these spin qubits work and how we make entangled states with them. I'll then tell you how we engineer single photons using these power electronic devices uh, in silicon carbide, how we can build photonic circuits to enhance interactions. And then finally, I'll tell you about another element of the stream of the quantum internet, which isn't this fiber optic backbone, but these modems to hook computers up to this entangled network of states. So once again, we have this dye vacancy in silicon carbide. We take a laser and we scan it over the surface of our sample. We see these nice dots. Each of these luminescent dots is a single sort of defect or this artificial trapped atom in a solid. In our case, this uh, state is a spin triplet. So there's three ground states, but that's no problem. We'll just use two of them as our qubit. And because it's a simple electron spin, we can just use electron spin resonance techniques to drive, tune, and manipulate the state using AC microwave magnetic fields and DC magnetic fields. But the thing that we really like about the system is not just that it has this nice electron spin ground state, but that it has this interface to light, these orbitals that we can talk to. So the key takeaway is that in this particular system, we have what we call a spin photon interface. And what that simply means is that we have our ground states we have three of them, it's a spin triplet. We have MS equals zero and MS equals plus minus one. And it turns out that in the selection rules of the system, just like there's selection rules in an atom, that certain ground states couple to certain orbital states and other ground states couple to a different set of orbital states. And those are frequency resolved. So we have spin selective, frequency resolved optical transitions. And for those AMO people in the audience, once you have that, you know, you can do a lot. You can pull all these tricks from atomic physics to optically pump and polarize your system, optically read out your system. And if you have that combined with this ability to do spin resonance and manipulate the qubit, you can do what's called optically detected magnetic resonance or optically detected Rabi oscillations, flipping this spin up to down, measuring the fluorescence change, and actually seeing these extremely high contrast Rabi oscillations in the system. And I won't have time to show the details of this, but we can also do this with extremely, extremely high single uh, single qubit gate fidelity approaching four nines. So we have extremely good control and readout of this system. And one of the other benefits of being in a solid is there's all these atoms surrounding us. And some of those atoms have a nuclear magnetic moment. And that nuclear magnetic moment, it's just another qubit. It's another magnetic two level system that we can play with. And sometimes it's a source of noise, but it can also be a resource because nuclear spins are some of the most robust quantum objects that we know of in science. They can have lifetimes, coherences that are minutes, hours, maybe even days. And because they're just magnetic objects and we have our electron spin, which is a magnetic object, we can couple these two systems together using the magnetic dipole-dipole interaction and actually create entangled states of single electrons and single nuclear spins uh, in the system. And finally, what I won't have a ton of time to, to tell you about is in the system, we can also have extremely long coherence times. And so actually recently, we recently uh, demonstrated what we think is the world record longest electron spin coherence 
uh, measured for system in a solid. So we, we measured a five second long coherence time in the system. And so that's an extremely long quantum coherence time if you're in the solid state. Maybe if you're an atomic physicist, this isn't special, but for us solid state people, this is extremely long. Mm -hmm. Yes. So first question is like, what's this splitting? We call that the zero field splitting um, or crystal field splitting. Basically what it is is, you know, the fact that you're in a solid that has some shape uh, splits these states from the, these states. Um, Ah, uh, these, yes. So what we do is we simply just add a small magnetic field and those split. Um, Cause the zero state doesn't move, the plus minus one state split. So we have a two tunable qubit energy just by applying a DC magnetic field. Yeah, we just use one of them. So we can either use the minus one or the plus one depending on what we sort of feel like that day. Okay. So we have these extremely long coherence times. We have this atom-like system in a solid. Um, we have this spin photon interface. And uh, this spin photon interface is really the magic ingredient that makes these systems useful. So if we do something like prepare a spin superposition of pointing up and down, and if the spin is pointing up, it absorbs and emits light. And if the spin is pointing down, it doesn't do anything. If we start off with the superposition and we try to scatter photons off the system, what we end up with actually is a spin photon entangled state of sort of up and emitting a photon and down and nothing happening. And so if we want to think about mediating interactions at long distances between electron spins, we can think about using light to mediate that interaction. And the way that we can do this is just by using a beam splitter. And so what we can do is sort of an analog of, of hunger mandel interference or DLCZ interference. So if we have a 50-50 beam splitter, and we have identical single photons that are coming in the two ports, A and B. So same frequency, same phase, same time, same spatial mode. Hung Mandel interference tells us that basically they like to pair up and exit either port C together or port D together. And what this means in practice is that we're essentially erasing the path information. Both of these photons are exiting the same port and they look the same, same frequency, same phase, same time. Um, and so this interference can actually be utilized. So if we create one of these spin photon entangled states where we're sort of down and emitting a photon and up and not emitting a photon, and we do this for two spins and then send those states into this beam splitter, due to this interference effect, if we measure one photon and one photon only, in a sense, we know that one spin is up and the other is down, but we can't tell which is which. And so quantum mechanically, this means that we're creating this superposition state where once again, if one spin is up, the other is down. And if one is down, the other is up. So we can use this beam splitter interaction and this spin photon entanglement to create long distance entanglement between two spins mediated by this interference at this beam splitter. And that's great, right? That's the thing that I was talking about at the very beginning of this dream of taking two electrons and entangling them or coupling to, uh, them together using light over long distances, where you can start to dream about this idea of a quantum internet, of distributing entangled states between spins. But uh, the problem, the reason that this dream sort of isn't everywhere today, the reason that this is still a science and engineering problem, is that even the best photons have lost. So, so fiber optic cable and telecommunications is amazing, right? Super low loss, great technology, but it's not zero loss. And so at 1550 nanometers, so-called telecom band, you have something like 0.2 dB per kilometer of loss, which if you're an engineer means something, uh, if you're not familiar with dBs, that's maybe a little bit harder to deal with. But what I like to think about is if I tried to send a single quantum state of a photon, between Stanford and Illinois to do some quantum information processing protocol, I would have to try 10 to the 77 times to succeed once just because the photon gets scattered and lost in that fiber optic link. So that's completely unacceptable for doing anything useful. 
And classically, this is fine. The reason that we can have you know, emails sent across the country with no loss is we just have amplifiers everywhere, boosting that signal as it propagates. But quantum mechanically, there's a problem. And that problem is we have the no cloning theorem, which basically means we can't amplify, copy, read and reproduce states without adding some noise or disturbing it. And uh, that would be sort of a killer for this dream of doing anything long distance with quantum states uh, that we basically can't amplify the, the states and there's too much loss. But luckily for all of us, there's a solution and that solution is called the quantum repeater. And the core idea here is instead of directly sending photons between A and C, these two end nodes, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have an intermediate node B. And as our first step, we're gonna entangle A and B together using this beam splitter mediated interaction I told you about. And then we're gonna have some local memory, like a little nuclear spin or just some other state to, to swap our uh, entanglement into. And we're gonna store one half of that entangled state into this memory. So right, we entangled A and B. Now we have half of the entangled state in B. We're gonna put it into a memory off to the side. And then we're gonna entangle B and C. So sort of a totally separate uh, event. And once we entangle B and C, we have two sets of entangled states. And the center node has two halves of the entangled state. And if we are able to do a local two qubit gate in measurement, depending on the result of that measurement, we actually create an overall entangled state between these end nodes. So why, why would you do this at all? Uh, basically, the reason that you would do this is you turn one highly improbable success of transmitting photons across the entire link length to two statistically sort of separated, probabilistically sort of independent processes that are much more likely. So if there's no significant loss between A and B, and these nodes are very, very close, this can happen with high rates. And if you're able to do this swapping, you can basically trade the entire link loss for two sort of more probable events to happen. And so you can turn from something like an exponential scaling to something that looks more polynomial. And that's extremely important because then you can beat this 10 to the 77 number of loss. And what's exciting is that we can do this entire scheme using these spins and solids. So we can have these electron spins, we can have them entangled using this beam splitter, and then we can have these local nuclear spins to store quantum information. And if we want to do this, our wish list is sort of simple. We need these long-lived quantum memories. Those are those nuclear spins and these electron spins. We need to be able to capture these states in a single shot, sort of do real quantum measurement. This is something we've demonstrated in this system. Uh, but perhaps more importantly is we need these photons to be identical, right? Have this interference happen. We need them to be you know, the same frequency, have the same phase and arrive at the same time. And it turns out that that's actually the hardest part of this entire problem. And so that's what we'll sort of talk about next is how we can use these electronic devices to make perfectly sort of coherent and reproducible single photon sources uh, in this system. So we can take a wafer that comes from the same supplier that might send Tesla. It's, you know, semiconductor for making uh, power inverters. And then we can actually put these defects inside, these quantum states inside. And so we asked this company to make us a simple electronic device, which is just a PIN diode. So we have a small intrinsic region, a P layer, and a, a N-type substrate. And then we can put these defects in the intrinsic region and we can actually measure them and manipulate them. So this is one of, once again, one of these spatial scans. Each of these dots is a single qubit that we can play with inside of this wafer came, that came from the commercial sort of electronics supplier. Once again, the problem is that those photons to interfere, they need to be indistinguishable. And the problem with these solid state emitters is that every defect is its own special butterfly. Every atom is the same, it's great. All the AMO physicists in the audience, I'm jealous of you. Defects and solids, they all have slightly different strain, different electric field, and they're all slightly different frequency. That's really horrible. Luckily for us, we can just simply apply electric field to sort of tune them up into resonance. And because we're in this power electronic device, we sort of naturally have a way to apply very controlled 
large electric fields uh, in the system. So we can start tuning the, syst the system and uh, in this PIN diode, because this is a high voltage, high power electronics material, we can actually do extreme amounts of tuning. So we can tune the system by almost a terahertz, which corresponds to around 40,000 line widths or about you know, 10,000 times the inhomogeneous inhom distribution of the system. So we have drastic control of the frequency of the system. And so these are example tuning curves of reverse bias versus you know, the frequency of the emission. Um, and what you notice is that these three different defects, these three different individual dots in this crystal, they have very different tuning curves. Um, and this is actually extremely important for understanding the physics of the system. So one, they have different slopes, okay? Maybe there's different susceptibilities to the Stark effect, that makes sense. But the other thing is that some defects, at first, nothing happens. You apply more and more voltage and there's no shift, there's no shift. And then all of a sudden they start shifting. And this actually just simply relates to the semiconductor physics of this PIN diode, uh, which for someone who comes from a physics background, I sort of had to figure out, but I think an electrical engineer might be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Uh, basically the problem here is instead of a P totally intrinsic N-type diode, there's a small amount of residual dopants in this intrinsic layer. No material's perfect. There's always some residual something in there. And in this case, it's slightly n-type. So if you think about a PN diode, right? You put a p-type semiconductor and n-type semiconductor next to each other. There's a little depletion region, a little electric field at that interface. And in this system, because this is slightly n-type, that depletion region and that electric field first only drops across this p sort of slightly n interface, and only by applying larger and larger reverse biases. Do you actually grow this depletion region and uh, make an electric field that looks more uniform through this intrinsic layer? And so this may seem sort of like, you know, why are we talking about this? This just seems like useless, uh, but this actually becomes really important in the next slide. So what we can actually do is by applying an electric field, change the uh, sort of distribution of dopants in this depletion region in this semiconductor. So we make these defects by <laughs> taking this wonderful wafer from this company. We ship it to Japan. They have this two MeV relativistic electron beam. We just damage the crap out of it. And then, uh, and then we anneal it and the, the vacancies find each other. So it's a, it's a sort of a top down qubit creation. This, so we have a tunable laser that we're using to do this sort of narrow spectroscopy. So it's, it's an optical, this is, the, this is the optical emission spectrum. And then we're measuring how that shifts with applied field. Okay, so our goal, right, was to stark shift these emitters. This is one of those emitters I was telling you about where at first you're applying voltage and then nothing happens. And then all of a sudden it starts to shift. But what you may also notice is that it's not just shifting, it's also narrowing. And that's extremely exciting for these systems because the number one problem not, is not that you know, they have different frequencies, these, these qubits have different frequencies, but it's actually that there's this thing called spectral diffusion, which is semiconductors are noisy and there's just electrical noise everywhere. There's fluctuating charges. It turns out that actually a single charge popping in and out of existence uh, 200 nanometers away from our defect is enough to shift us by more than a line width. So it's extremely sensitive to nearby charges. And because semiconductors and real solid state systems are really noisy, it means that this thing's just bouncing around all the time because there's this fluctuating bath of electrical noise. And so this narrowing is actually then really, really cool because what it means is that at zero bias, we have this fluctuating bath of free electrons and holes. But as we apply a reverse bias, as we make this depletion region in the semiconductor, we sort of drift and diffuse away all of the free electrons and holes, leaving behind sort of a near perfect environment for our two level system to live. So because we have this semiconductor control of the system, we can actually engineer all those fluctuating charges to go away, leaving behind a very coherent two level system to play with. And there's no funny physics here. This is just the same physics that goes into 
how a PN diode works, right? We're at this interface. Once again, there's an electric field, but you're also completely devoid of any free carriers. And that's the physics that we're utilizing here to engineer highly coherent quantum emission. The system is extremely stable over many hours. Um, so this is, our, this is a measurement over, over um, three hours and basically only see a factor of two from the lifetime limit. So we're, we have an extremely narrow line that's sort of rock steady. And um, we can approach the lifetime limit, which is this uh, dotted yellow line here. Um, and in this, in this particular sample, we saw a factor of 50 in the narrowing of this optical emission. So we have 40,000 line widths of tunability, and we also have near lifetime limited emission that uh, you know, we can engineer by playing with the semiconductor physics of the system. And it turns out actually as well that if we apply this voltage in the system, we can also increase the spin coherence times as well, uh, which is work that I won't talk about here in PRX quantum. So we can use our ability to engineer this real semiconductor to make optical emission better and spin coherence better. And we can only do that because this is a real semiconductor that you can dope and you can actually control the charges in it. So that's one of the key advantages of silicon carbide. So I'll now move on to this, this idea of like, you know, how do we use tonics to enhance interactions? So uh, I guess if I went to this checklist of like, okay, Chris, like what's actually needed to like realize your dream? We've gone through over the past five, 10 years and really hit a lot of our check marks, which is really, really exciting. We have high fidelity control. We have these long lived nuclear spins. We emit in the near infrared or near telecoms for low, for low loss. Um, we have these tunable, stable, coherent single photons. We have single shot readout. We have this longest coherence ever measured, which is great. Uh, so what's the problem? The problem is that photons, while they're great at mediating interactions at a distance, they're also sort of like, um, they're hard to wrangle. So if you think about a dipole source of photons, it's a lot like a light bulb. It just shoots photons everywhere, every which direction. And actually a lot of the times that emission is sort of spectrally broad. And what that means in practice is that this is an extremely poor mediator of interaction. So if I want to use my photon to interact with something over there, I don't want my photon to go hit this wall over here. I sort of want directional and narrow photon emission. And this is exactly where photonics comes into play. So as some of you may know, if you put a two-level system in an optical cavity, a Fabry-Perot cavity, a nanophotonic cavity, there's this Purcell effect. And that Purcell effect basically just modifies the available density of states for your two-level system to sort of emit its energy into. And basically, if you put your sort of atom or your artificial atom in a cavity, you can make that atom preferentially emit in the cavity mode, which has a very specified spatial sort of orientation and, and, and shape, and also a very specific spectral shape. And we can basically turn this, this quasi-isotropic and broad emission to something that's directional and narrow through this Purcell effect, which the strength of this basically scales as the quality factor of our optical resonator over the mode volume. So we want something with extremely high resonance, like lots of bounces in the mirrors. Uh, uh, and we also want something that's very, very, very small. Um, and this is exactly what we've been working on at Stanford. How do you make small, high quality factor optical resonators in silicon carbide? And basically this problem boils down to something quite simple, which is how do you make good integrated photonics or how do you make photonic devices that are small? And it's simply just this statement of how do you make high quality thin films on quote unquote insulator? So why do I say quote unquote insulator? Insulator in most cases just means glass, SiO2, which is a low loss, but also low index of refraction optical material. And so ideally what you would want is a thin film of silicon carbide on this low index of refraction material. Then you'd be able to etch sort of using standard nanofabrication techniques, these little sort of rectangular cross section, we call them waveguides. And if you make this, device starting from this thin film on insulator, what you actually have is a high index of refraction material surrounded on all sides by a lower index of refraction. So basically once you have this, by total internal reflection, you can basically guide light at the nanoscale in this sort of wire for light. And so in practice, we make these films, although there's many ways, using sort of the simplest possible thing you can maybe think of, 
which is we take our wonderful wafer scale quantum grade silicon carbide, we bond it to glass, SiO2, and then we sandpaper, mechanically remove 99.999% of the material until we're just left with a micron. And then once we have one micron left, we can then go in the clean room and we can fabricate wonderful optical resonators at the nanoscale that also have high quality factor. And one of the benefits of silicon carbide is that it's actually a very easy material to fabricate. So we've been able to make optical resonators with quality factors over 5 million with extremely low loss. For those fab people in the audience, the sidewalls look really great. Uh, so it's an easy to fabricate material that we can make small, high quality factor optical resonators out of. And over the past you know, three years or so at Stanford, we've really been boosting this quality factor through the roof, uh, through improvements in materials and fabrication. So now we're having you know, almost 10 million quality factors, which is great. And perhaps most excitingly is we're pushing this towards true wafer scale fabrication. So here's an image of, of me holding a four inch wafer of thin film silicon carbide on an insulator. So we're sort of almost approaching this like silicon photonics level of being able to make integrated photonics with this quantum material, which is very exciting. So now I think the, the fun part is I get to say, like we sort of have all the check marks. We have all the things that I told you before, but we also have these high Q scalable photonic devices. What I didn't show you is that we can also integrate these quantum states into those photonic structures, and they actually maintain their coherence properties pretty well. So that's very exciting. And so I think basically we have all these major milestones achieved for this dream of scaling silicon carbide based quantum networks, which I think is just a really exciting place to be. We've done sort of a lot of the hard work. Now it's time to do the fun applications in science. So I hope I've sort of convinced you that this silicon carbide platform is somewhat interesting if you've not heard of it before, where we have the longest spin coherence measured for a single electron spin. We have extremely narrow and tunable single photons emitted from these systems. We have these nuclear spins we can play with and entangle. And we have this wafer scalable, high quality factor nanophotonic capability in this platform for making sort of wafer scale quantum science devices using the same wafers once again that go maybe get shipped to Tesla for doing quantum repeaters and quantum communications tech. And then maybe even having dreams of doing uh, photonic uh, based quantum, quantum computing using silicon carbide, Brian. <laughs> so between an electron and nuclear spin, that's, that works. So if your question is how to do that, then we can talk about that. Uh, between two electrons is, is tough and everything has to be like some teleported gate basically. So you have your heralded entanglement, low rates, low fidelity. You create your big entangled state, and then you do measurements and things to actually implement your, 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 your algorithm or whatever you want in that. So, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously, if, if light's doing the talking, if you have things off chip with low success probability, doing quantum protocols is really, really tough. But if you have everything inside of the same optical resonator, where essentially there's no loss between the light coupling to one system to another, and you have what's called high cooperativity, you can actually do really interesting two qubit gates in the same optical resonator. Uh, so that's also a, a fun dream to have. Okay. So silicon carbide, what we think is, can implement this, this, this quantum network dream of making entangled states at a distance. That's great and that's fun. Uh, the problem is, is that spins make horrible, horrible quantum computers, and they probably will never be used as a quantum computer. Um, and so we can make entangled states, but we can't do anything with them. And that's a problem. And that's where this next sort of dream comes in, which is building something that I like to call a quantum modem, which is hooking real computers, like a superconducting based quantum processor, up to an optical network that's maybe sort of supported by these solid state spin qubits. The problem with this dream of, let's say, coupling a superconducting based processor to an optical network, it's, it's really tough because you actually have to make up a factor of 30,000 in both energy and temperature. So you have to go from this sort of microwave millikelvin regime of superconducting circuits up to this room temperature optical frequency regime of photonics. And doing this in a quantum coherent way is actually a really tough outstanding problem in the field. 
And so we want to have this dream of like, you know, this distributed network and then these little modems that hook up our dill fridges to that network. And luckily for us, there's a way that's sort of already been thought about on how to do this. And it's just by using electro optics or essentially nonlinear optics of materials. And essentially what you can do is through something called the Pockels effect, which is a linear sort of shift of the index of refraction of a material with an applied electric field. Once you have that ability to change the index of refraction, you can actually change the phase of light as it propagates through that material, right? You can change its index. You can change how much phase is accumulated as it propagates through that crystal. This is related to something called the Chi-2 nonlinearity of the crystal, for those of you who sort of speak nonlinear optics. Um, but once you have this interaction, you can do a really interesting thing, which is basically called three-wave mixing, which in practice means you can have some optical pump. That's maybe, let's say, a telecom photon. And then some low frequency microwave photon that maybe comes from your super nutting processor. And due to a nonlinear mixing of those two frequencies in this crystal through electro optics, you can actually encode the microwave information as a modulation on your optical field. Now, uh, I won't go into too much details here, but basically the takeaway from this dream is that if your goal is to do this with high efficiency, converting microwaves to optics with high efficiency, you need this nonlinear coefficient to be very, very large. And the reason that no one's made an internet of quantum computers is that traditional materials are just not nonlinear enough to mediate this interaction efficiently. The efficiencies for people that do this type of experiment are commonly 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four. It's completely unacceptable for doing anything useful. And so we got really excited about this idea of searching for new nonlinear optical materials to perform this transduction dream. And so there's this really cool uh, plot from IBM, which shows the Pockels coefficient or the nonlinearity of the crystal as a function of just all these different material systems. And this is actually a log scale. So there's orders of magnitude difference between these different systems. And we became interested in sort of saying like, how can we understand or predict nonlinear optical materials and find the best one for this particular application? And we can sort of understand this plot by something called Miller's rules which is a heuristic from optics, which this is a lot of equations, but simply just says, if you want three waves to mix together in a crystal, then you better be linearly susceptible to the three frequencies that make up that interaction. So if you want three frequencies to mix in your soup, you need your soup to like be able to take all the three frequencies effectively. So you need your linear susceptibility to the three frequencies to all be high. And the same goes with this so-called four wave mixing process. So in the language of nonlinear optics, what that means is that the chi-2, this three-wave mixing process, is in a sense proportional to the linear susceptibility or like sort of the dielectric constant or the index of refraction of the three frequencies that make up this three-wave interaction. But just this simple heuristic actually can let us completely understand all of this trend here. Uh, and once again, this is sort of this linear electro-optic effect where one of these frequencies is basically zero and one of them is an optical frequency. And so in practice, what that means is that um, this chi-2 is proportional to the, the sort of low frequency dielectric constant and, and, uh, and two units of this high frequency dielectric constant. So, so why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because one of the wonderful things about materials is actually their susceptibility or their dielectric response changes drastically as a function of frequency. <clears throat> so actually, most materials have a very similar index of refraction, somewhere between like one and four. So you can't really engineer this to be high in the optical regime, but in the low frequency microwave regime, there are certain materials that have extremely high dielectric constant. And because this uh, nonlinear response becomes proportional to this, this low frequency dielectric constant, if we simply just find materials that have high dielectric constants, we can completely solve this problem. And so this plot here from IBM can be completely explained just by the dielectric constants of all these materials. And so the worst ones have low dielectric constant and the high ones have high dielectric constant. And the, the upshot of all of this is if you wanna do quantum things at low temperature, you can't use this plot because this plot is only relevant for room temperature. This is the room temperature dielectric constants, the room temperature Pockels coefficient. And so if we want to do this transduction dream, 
we need materials with a high dielectric constant at low temperatures. Elizabeth. Yes. The polymers are pretty good looking. No, there's, uh, there's people researching this, um, but it's sort of an unsolved problem. I saw a vague announcement from some startup company saying they had solved it and they wanted to make interconnects for superinducting devices, but I haven't seen anything yet. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'll go through this, I think sort of fairly quickly, but what we like, right? The, the core message is we want things that mix frequencies together. We want that to work at low temperature. So we want high dielectric constant systems at low temperature. The types of systems that we like that have these high dielectric constants, they're called ferroelectric perovskites. And just in the same way you have ferromagnets and paramagnets, you can have paraelectrics and ferroelectrics with a Curie temperature. And if you think about the polarization as a function or the energy as a function of polarization, above the Curie temperature, <clears throat> you sort of have this harmonic looking nonpolar response. But as you cool close to the, the phase transition temperature, your system becomes extremely susceptible to perturbations until finally you undergo the phase transition, you drop into one of these sort of macroscopic polarization states, and then you're stuck in one of these little harmonic wells. And so if your goal is to make something that has a high dielectric constant, that has a high susceptibility, actually being close to this phase transition temperature means that you can have extremely high susceptibility. And so actually, if you plot the dielectric constant as a function of temperature, as you approach this phase transition, your dielectric constant explodes. And that's really, really exciting. And so if we simply just want to find a system with a high dielectric constant to make a nonlinear optical system, we simply just want to find a system that approaches a phase transition near zero temperature. And the exciting thing is that this type of system has been known for forever. It's sort of the classic condensed matter system that many of you probably study, which is strontium titanate. And what I like about it is that it's also a fake diamond. So it's this nice optical material that actually was used for fake diamonds for a while. And as you cool the system down, its dielectric constant explodes to being greater than 20,000 at basically all quantum relevant temperatures, 10K and below. So strontium titanate is a great optical material that has crazy high dielectric constants at all low temperature ranges. And that's exactly what we were looking for. Now, this uh, sort of fact that we'd actually never undergo a phase transition. So we, we go up and up and up, but then in a regular ferroelectric, we undergo a phase transition and the dielectric constant drops. In strontium titanate, we go up and up and up and then we never drop. This is related to the so-called quantum paraelectric phase of this material. And basically what that means is that this potential well is so flat and this barrier is so low that actually zero point fluctuations sort of bounce you back and forth between these two polarization states. And so you actually never undergo this phase transition. So we're, we're always approaching a phase transition. We always have this extreme susceptibility, but we actually never reach it. But that's actually great for having this high dielectric constant. So I think the, the thing I wanna sort of communicate next is the fact is like, this is not just theory, we can actually go and we can measure the electro-optic nonlinearity of the system using uh, a Mach Zender interferometer, which basically just encodes the phase shift of the light as it goes through the strontium titanate inside of our cryostat into an amplitude modulation uh, through this interferometer. We can use that to measure this electro-optic coefficient. And the exciting thing is even with a bulk crystal, where our electrodes are really, really far apart and we're limited by our bias fields, we're already measuring nonlinearities that are 10 times greater than lithium niobate. And lithium niobate is this sort of workhorse uh, nonlinear optical material uh, that's actually been used for these uh, transduction dreams. And so we're already beating the best available photonic material by a factor of 10 the first time we measured it at 4 Kelvin. It has this very sort of, uh, you know, what we expected uh, for the temperature dependence where it has this sort of blowing up at 10K and then flattening out. And the sort of takeaway from this is this is a bulk measurement and we actually don't know what the properties will be like in a waveguide. And actually in this case, we're actually increasing the nonlinearity with an applied bias field. And because this is a large crystal, 
we're actually just, we have a 200 volt source. It's a one millimeter crystal. That's the end of this plot and it was still going up. And so once we have this waveguide that's around you know, five, 10 microns of gap, we actually don't know how high this nonlinearity will be at the end of the day. So I think the main takeaway here, um, I went through that a little bit fast, is we've already discovered the most tunable, highest nonlinearity electro-optic crystal at low temperatures. And that's exactly what you want to utilize for doing quantum photonic tasks at low temperature. Um, so I guess in summary, I guess I rushed through a little bit at the end there, um, is we have these two amazing platforms, right? We have this ability to make this robust quantum network backbone using long-lived electron spins with this interface to light using silicon carbide. And then we have this ability to sort of explore new condensed matter systems, new material systems for doing nonlinear optics tests at low temperatures for quantum. And if you really combine those two dreams, you can think about realizing this vision of a quantum internet potentially. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, you all and the people that actually made this work happen. Um, and then I will end uh, with something a little bit different in the last two minutes, which is like sort of why, why material science? So right at the very beginning, David was like, oh, Chris, he's going to be in material science. You know, how does this all connect to material science? And I think really it's this understanding that if you do anything with real materials, with solids, it's sort of at a, at a, at a basic level, like all material science. It's all about, you know, we put these artificial atoms in a solid. What are their core problems? The core problems is these surfaces, these magnetic states in the crystal how phonons work, how charges move around in these crystals. So it's all about this sort of materials understanding of your qubit and sort of engineering that to make these systems better and about designing new quantum relevant materials. Like this discovery of silicon carbide as a use for a quantum system was really based on this idea of exploring new materials and this idea of you know, finding new nonlinear optical materials for quantum. I think just sort of highlight this idea of, you know, if we are willing to explore new things, we can find new materials that have exciting applications in quantum. And there was even this nice review article in Nature Reviews and Materials that talked about how sort of engineering qubits meets the sort of challenges and also perhaps more excitingly, the sort of expertise of material scientists, which I think is very great. Um, and you know, the shout out here is like, I'm here full time. Uh, we're building the labs literally down the hall here. Um, it's a little bit of a construction war zone, but like we're coming. Uh, and I, I really do believe in this dream of like, which actually was in the nice material science building. So there's me taking this, the photo of it. Um, but like, you know, developing new materials to revolutionize quantum technologies is critical for making these things actually useful. And also going beyond silicon for doing semiconductors, this sort of silicon carbide dream is, is critical too. And so I'm excited to sort of take those ideas combining material science and, and physics and engineering to make some fun advances in, in quantum. And as the final shout out, uh, we have this, the cover article of Physics Today last month. So you all should check it out. Um, that talks about some of these dreams and opportunities. And uh, as a final note, once again, I'm recruiting. So please help me if you know anyone, if you're interested. Uh, I'm, I'll be taking students in material science, physics, and EC. My temporary office is an MRL. So please come bother me. And I'm just uh, you know, really happy to be here and to be able to, to meet and talk to you all. So thanks again for everything. Kind of, uh, is the kind of a question. So have you fabricated some uh, photonic devices on the, for example, STO and in the, examine the quality? And if the quality is not that high, will that affect the efficiency of the construction or? Yeah, so this is the, this is the great question. So uh, absolutely, yes. Thin films and devices always degrade properties and that's always the problem that we have. So the thing that I think is sort of, unique about the way that we make photonic devices is we, do not, we don't grow thin films. When you grow films, they're on a substrate. That substrate usually isn't lattice match. There's strain, 
It's not a perfect single crystal. You know, maybe it's not super pure. That's not how we make photonics. We do this thing I've sort of showed you at the beginning where we take the highest quality thing you can buy. And then we do this bonding and then polishing and thinning to make sort of bulk like thin films and devices. And that's what really enabled silicon carbide photonics to work. And we actually have preliminary devices in strontium titanate, thin films. Um, we don't know all of the properties yet, but I think that's why it's a fun research direction. I was just curious about the scalability of silicon carbide with thin films. I mean, the thickness variation would be quite a lot. And then you try to make devices. I think the repeatability would be hard, right? Because just the thickness is hard to control. So this is a, this is a pro question. So um, silicon photonics, which you probably like underpins a lot of the technology used today, but you probably don't know it, is wonderful. They have like 200 nanometer thick films over like eight inch wafers or something crazy. And it's really reproducible. Um, for us, we're not at that level yet. Um, but what we do have is four inch wafers where we have one micron films that have only 100 nanometer variation over the full film. And so if you're making, you know, little two by two centimeter, one by one centimeter devices, actually that uniformity is pretty good. So we're not at this ultimate, ultimate scalability that silicon's at, but we're at a level where if you're just doing small scale quantum science, or maybe even medium scale quantum science, that's plenty. Um, you know, the, 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 the scaling argument isn't really like a cost related thing for us. It's more about like the ease of fabrication. It's like grad student hours that matter, not like the cost of the sample. So we're already at that level where things are uniform enough to do like tons of devices on a single chip with no uniformity issues. <laughs> so that was me just being, uh, uh, yeah. So we don't actually use sandpaper, but uh, so yeah, we use like a mechanical grinding and lapping. And then we finish that off with a CMP to get a super smooth surface. Um, and then we just use an ICP RIE to etch these sidewalls. And then of course they're like maybe a little rough. And so one thing you can do, which is related to your question maybe is you can go back over it again with a polishing tool and you can actually smooth out those sidewalls. So people do this for some photonic devices where they'll do all their fabrication and then they'll come and they'll polish it afterwards and you can sort of round off some roughness. We don't do that, but you could do that. It's, it's almost noon and that means it's lunchtime. We'll thank Chris again and join her. Yeah, so five seconds here. What happens to the new spin doing? Uh, we we uh